Okay, so this, uh, this panel that we have today is, um, is one that uh, it's, it's in a response of um, something that I am told and have been told over many years of working here um, as support faculty. And um, that is uh, whenever we sort of meet with faculty for the, for the first time or um, if they've been teaching for years and then they find out about us, the first thing they tell us is, oh, I wish I would have known that when I started teaching. And um, so uh, we brought these folks here in uh, to sort of answer those questions for you and give, give you their perspective of um, their teaching experience. And um, so on that, uh, I'd like to um, introduce, we have Marlene here with us. So she's out of our NDFS, and I'm going to let them sort of give introductions and a little bit of their background, if you guys don't mind. Um, and then Harrison here with philosophy, um, Alexa with art history, and then David with creative arts. So um, I, I don't want to take up any of their time now because we don't have a lot of time, but um, if you don't mind just sharing a little bit about your experience and sort of um, take this first part to just sort of say what you wish you would have known when you started teaching and then a little of your background. I have to go first. Well, I'm Harrison Kleiner. I teach philosophy. Um, a bit more about what I teach. I teach a heavy teaching load. I teach 4-4, uh, mostly gen ed classes. So um, philosophy is a pretty small major here. Um, so the vast majority of my students are gen ed students, um, not students in my program. Um, <clears throat> what I wish I'd known, I thought of two things. Um, one, I wish somebody had told me to document what I was doing from the very beginning. I taught here for 11 years before I began documenting anything that I was doing when I went up for a promotion. And um, it was very difficult to recreate my own history. Uh, I think it's really worthwhile to keep an Evernote or a journal or a something where you change an assignment, make a note, and, and say why you changed it. And it doesn't have to be some huge account, but something that later you could... Um, turn into a narrative about how your teaching developed over time. So I, I wish somebody had told me that. Um, the second thing that I wish I'd known is that students, or at least many of my students, don't know how to be students. Um, so this is even just four years ago, something I discovered. I had been spending all of this time putting comments into Canvas where I'd grade their papers. And none of the students, they just looked at their grade. They never clicked on the assignment where it would take them to see where I'd put all the comments. So I had been spending an obscene amount of time putting all of these comments on that were just never even seen. And so, you know, I sort of just assumed that students knew I was putting comments on the papers and would go and find them. So um, I wish I'd known that students really lacked some of the sort of tools or skills or know-how that I sort of assumed they were coming in with. I, I would suggest that you assume that they come in with very little. Um, my name is Marlene Israelson Graf, and I teach in the Nutrition, Dietetic, and Food Sciences Department, and I really like it. My uh, teaching assignment mostly focuses on uh, the introductory nutrition courses, and so I also teach uh, a Cute, big gen ed class and mostly incoming freshmen and um, when I was hired when I first started I was in my, my, my mid 20s I was hired on January 3rd classes started on Monday January 7th and my first class was in this auditorium here it holds 500 students and it was a rough semester so what I wish I would have known uh, was that I didn't have to do it by myself. I wish I had been more aware of the resources on campus that would help me be a better teacher because I felt like I knew the content as a dietitian, but I had never been trained how to teach. And so uh, I feel like the university has really um, built that resource since I've been here. And the guys at City and, and girls at City are a phenomenal resource. And the ETC 
conferences that are coming up and the provost lecture series and that sort of thing, they would have been really helpful to me early on and I wouldn't have struggled so much. One thing that I'm really glad that I did do was uh, early on, I kind of constructed a teaching philosophy and it was uh, pretty rough to begin with and it's changed since every time, every year. But it gave me at least um, a, a base where I could say, okay, here's my purpose as a teacher. And then everything I developed, I could say, is it, is it, um, is my teaching philosophy in here somewhere? And I have, and at first I never shared that with my students, but the more I teach, the more I've seen that it's effective to share that with your students. I just give them a simplified version on the first day of class so they understand why I have certain policies in place and what I'm trying to accomplish as a teacher and hoping that they'll learn as a student. Um, one thing I'm really glad that I did also was I, I identified four faculty members. Um, three of them are in different disciplines and I just invited myself to their class. I, I emailed them ahead of time and asked if I could come, but I went and just sat in on a lecture that they did and then we met afterwards and I just kind of picked their brain and I said, what works for you and what doesn't? What have you tried and what went well? And what do you think about this idea? And, and they just kind of became, um, well, my go-to people when I needed to bounce an idea off someone. And they gave me a lot of new ideas that I was able to adapt so that it fit my class better. And I'm so glad that I started that network early because uh, that that was the most beneficial thing I think I could have done that first year. Uh, hi, I'm David Wall. I'm in the Department of Art and Design. I, I would echo um, what these guys have said. It's a sort of an odd question in some ways to think about what I wish I'd known because I didn't know anything about teaching. You know, I hadn't had that experience. And so, you know, if you say to somebody, what don't you know? Well, what's the answer to that question, right? So, um, but I think ha having had the experience of doing it for for many years now, the, uh, the, the importance of, of sort of maintaining some kind of record of what you're doing is really critical. A, because it, it's, it's helpful sort of institutionally, but also to be clear for yourself, but also in terms of, um, I, I think it took me some time to realize the importance of clarity with everything for students. So especially with the syllabus, and this is not, the, I, I don't want to sort of sound negative, but the thing is, and I teach, I'm the guy on, keep, on campus that teaches the class with a thousand students, creative arts. And when you're dealing with that many students in one class, it's just a different thing, it's a different beast. It's not just a bigger class. Doing that, which was a real trial by fire when I first, the first semester I was here and I did that, and I had no, I, I taught big classes, 100, 150, quote unquote big classes. I thought, oh, well, that's fine, yeah, what's well, just a big class, but of course you have no, no idea of that. Um, but it taught me all sorts of really crucial things which are, of course, applicable to every class that you teach. And one of which is, like I say, this importance of clarity. I think students want to know as clearly as possible what it is they're doing, what it is you expect from them, and what it is that they're going to get out of it at the end. And it's sort of, it's trying to imagine as many things as you can to head off at the pass before they arrive. And there's nothing, um, you know, each, each group of students, whether it's 30, whether it's 50, whether it's 500, whether it's 1,000, is a body which, of course, is made up of different cellular components, but the body is essentially the same thing. So every 1,000 students, you've got a different group of students, but you're going to have the same problems, the same issues are going to come up again and again and again in terms of deadlines, in terms of not knowing what work they need to be doing, in terms of all those sorts of things. So clarity is really important, I think. Um, and the other thing is, which maybe is a bit more sort of, uh, a bit more woolly, I guess, is 
and this is a really, it's a kind of cliched thing to say, I suppose, because you hear people in teaching talk about it all the time, but really absolutely being confident enough to say, I've got no idea. I don't know whether it's an answer to a question, whether it's an answer to a problem. Um, and I think, again, for me, I, re I, I reached a point of being able, com being able to be confident to say, I don't know, only because I felt confident in what I was doing. And the first time, you know, when I started teaching in, in grad school as an assistantship, I turned up a week before the semester started. I met with the guy that was running the program. He gave me a copy of the textbook and said, you're starting at 8.30 on Monday morning. I mean, that was it. And when I think about those poor students now, I think, oh, I mean, you know, it was not a terribly positive experience for any of us, I don't think. Thankfully, it's not like that anymore, and it's certainly not like that at USU. USU has some great resources, thankfully. In, in there's so much support here in all sorts of ways. There's really good institutional support, but also, to, again, to echo what, what you said, if you, if you find people to go and kind of interact with and be with, that's, that's really productive. Um, and again, just I, I guess this is, is the, the last, last point, is that, for me, the, it's the experience of doing it. You can't train, you can't teach someone to teach like you teach someone to drive, I don't believe. You can give all sorts of interesting pointers. It's in the experience of doing it. And I guess to you, if you carry on the driving analogy, you're not a great driver even though you just passed your test, are you? You might be a really good driver a year down the road. But. I'm Alexa Sand. I'm also in the Department of Art and Design. I teach art history. Um, I also teach not huge courses, but a large survey course, um, and, and I teach smaller courses as well. Um, a lot of what uh, Harrison, Marlene, and David have already said, I think I would just endorse, especially about documentation and about resources here at USU. It's not just CD, but also the um, the library has great support for teaching. You can take your class to the library. You can have the librarians create a live guide for your for your class, that kind of thing. And I encourage anyone who hasn't done those things to tap into them because I think they're really, um, they just make the job easier. You know, they take some of the responsibility off your, off your plate. Um, but in terms of what I wish I had known when I started teaching, um, and maybe this is something you just can't know or you couldn't know in 1990 when I started teaching. Um, but the fact that there's a whole literature, a whole um, scholarship on teaching and that you can approach your teaching the same way you approach your scholarship, I think that didn't really come to my attention until I got here to USU and I was, you know, in a, a what was the um, classroom management system we used back then? Like black? Yeah, WebCT. I was in a WebCT training session with Ann Austin, who's now the director of the Center for Women and Gender. And we were sitting there um, making fun of another participant who didn't know how to click and drag. And um, she said, oh, you should come join my scholarly teaching initiative um, group. And so I didn't know what that was, but since she seemed like somebody who knew her way around on campus, I joined it. And it was really revelatory for me to encounter. I mean, some of you may be from the College of Education, so you're totally laughing at me. But I didn't know that people studied how college students learn, you know. And, and I think tapping into that literature and finding um, sort of philosophies and approaches that weren't covered in my um, eight years of postgraduate education were really, really important for me. And particularly, number one, is the idea of um, sort of a design-oriented, or I mean an outcomes-oriented design process so that I sit down before I write a syllabus, I think what are the learning outcomes that I want my students to have? Instead of just starting from like, oh, here's my textbook, I'm gonna go through chapter one, that's about prehistoric art, and then we're gonna do the Sumerians, you know, like instead of thinking that way, I start with what are the like most important understandings, skills, um, concepts, 
and, and sort of transferable things that students are going to take out of this course. So I, I wish I had known that I could do that when I started teaching instead of just sort of reproducing the structure and logic of the textbook. Maybe, I, I mean, I was very naive, but um, I think teaching has changed a lot in the last 20 years too, and the scholarly approach to teaching is more widely disseminated now. Just add something to that. It's, it's interesting, just what you said, I hadn't thought about this before, but the, and again, this is something that experience has taught me, but it would have been good to have someone speak to this bef sort of uh, early, early on, is that um, if someone had said, don't just think about what you want to teach, think about what it is the students might want to learn or how they might want to learn or what your outcomes are. Because you've all got enthusiasms and, and that's the stuff that you really want to kind of deal with. But it's, again, if someone has said it's important to think about what the students, you know, because it's, uh, it's, it takes two to tango, doesn't it? It's a sort of, a, a, you know, there's a relationship there, a discrete relationship between you and the students. So it's not just about what you want to do. Um, and the, the kind of, the, 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 sort of scholarly landscape has changed. It's changed really positively. Um, and having said that, I think also it's really important to keep, make sure you keep the horse before the cart. There's a whole bunch, there's a million different ways that you can approach teaching, of course, and you can do different things, and you can try different strategies, but there's always one thing, which is the process of encouraging students to learn. And if you think, again, for me, thinking about that is the key thing rather than thinking about, well, should I flip the classroom or should I have them do this exercise, should I have them do that? All those things are really good tools, but they're not, they sh the tool should not become the master of the process, I think. Thank you. Um, so uh, there were a couple things that I sort of heard from all of you. Um, one is, uh, you, you, there, I heard that about documenting your teaching is very important. Um, and then developing a teaching philosophy, two of which are items um, that I assume you used when you went up for promotion and tenure. And um, so it's a good teaching practice, but yet also something that adds value down the road when you're going up for promotion. Um, I would like to, to get a little more understanding um, of, of quite a few things, but one is you talked a bit about uh, objectives or use of outcomes. How do you go about uh, that process in terms of um, really from the beginning of designing your class, um, getting assigned a topic, and, and approaching it in an objectives or outcomes model from the beginning? Uh, what's sort of the process you go through to do that? Um, well, I'll say something. I wanted to, this is to answer to that, but it's to echo the things you guys have said. There's a value for the student um, in having this outcomes oriented. Um, <clears throat> one of the mistakes I think I made early on was assuming that all of my students were like me. Um, and faculty members, when they reflect on their own experience in college, are getting a really bad read on what your average college student is like because we all geeked out in school for like decades um, and have, I assume, some kind of native enthusiasm for our field and for learning in general. And that, of course, isn't always true of every college student you'll have in your class. And having the outcomes orientation gives them a why, and they won't care at all about the what's and the how's unless they have a why first. And the kind of what do I want them to learn? Right? What's the outcome? What are they going to be able to do? What are they going to be able to communicate what are they going to be able to accomplish, whatever it would be, um, is really important. In terms of how to do it, um, we have here an, a course evaluation system that is outcomes oriented. It's called the IDEA course evaluation. Um, and that is new since I've been here, but um, there's 12, 10, 12. Um, since they reduce all learning to 12 bullet points, each is, of course, pretty general and sort of abstracted to the point of perhaps not saying a lot. But I always start there. Um, uh, and it's made me, in a way, oddly less content focused. You know, I want to just make sure I get through this whole book or something. It's, well, what do I want them to be able to, in philosophy, 
are they going to remember Plato's theory of forms in 15 years? Probably not. But I hope they're better critical thinkers 15 years from now as a result of my class. Um, so I really let the idea evaluations, which I would encourage you to put on your syllabus, the ones that you've chosen. Um, and I, I let that sort of steer my process. So um, when I mentioned this sort of outcomes-driven planning, or what designers call backwards planning or reverse planning, um, I've, one of the really helpful resources that I found is coming out of Harvard. They have a project called, uh, I think it's called Learning by Design, or is that what it's called? Learning by Design, and it's, it's about um, designing syllabi and um, and, it, it, and it's really applicable from, you know, primary through uh, post-secondary education. It's just a sort of series of best practices for thinking about how you identify your goals. And of course, some of them are institutionally driven. As Harrison mentioned, the idea goals, I, I do find them very vague. Um, so in my syllabi for, for my students' benefit, I identified the idea goals because I know I'm going to be evaluated on those. But then I tie them to more specific language about the course goals. Um, and I try to be kind of humorous about it, too, so that they'll remember them, because people tend to remember. I, I noticed a long time ago when I, when I had smaller classes and I assigned more writing um, in my survey that the jokes were the only thing that they repeated verbatim on the, on the essay responses. Um, you know, they would remember anything I'd made a joke about and forget everything else. Um, so that, that, that might be a teaching strategy, I'm not sure. But, um, but they, the outcomes-oriented design really focuses not on, um, I want my students to know the names, dates, and um, you know, location of 175 different works of art, which when I was studying art history as an undergraduate, that was pretty much how it worked. You, I, I always give my students this example so that they'll feel grateful, um, that you know, they would put up two slides and say, one of these paintings is a copy of, of another painting by a famous artist, so it's a, a copy by a famous artist of another famous artist. Identify which painting is the copy um, and who the artists were, you know? And so that involved a lot of visual training, but also just a lot of rote memorization. Um, and I don't do that anymore. Um, and that's because I design my courses around I, uh, what I call understandings, which are in the literature of, of higher education, um, not so much uh, sets of facts or skills which, are, which contribute to those understandings, but rather transferable concepts and um, sort of um, ways of thinking. And so I start with those very high level sort of lofty goals and then I work backwards from there. Does that answer your question, John? I, I think also, um, just sort of pragmatically, if you think about outcomes, you know, it might be determined by the level of course. If you're teaching a 100 level or or a, or a thousand, I guess here or 3,000, that's going to be different. And it's also dependent on how many students you have. And I and I bore everybody with this. I know I do, but a thousand students is a different thing to deal with because you've got potentially a thousand conversations you've got to have about those things. And that's where clarity is really important. And also that there's a, there's a sort of, if you could be really clear about your outcomes having decided that, there's a real practical use to that, which is that you don't get students saying, well, I didn't understand, or it wasn't made clear to me, or how come this is, my grade is this, because I didn't understand that. And so the outcomes, are re they're really important in a kind of, I suppose a philosophical sense or a pedagogical sense, but they're also just really important practically because you can just stop those, um, I'm fishing for the right word, you can just stop those tensions right there. And I feel, I feel at best ambivalent about the ideas system 
because it is absurd to reduce those things to 12 bullet points. And again, it's one of those things that for me, I, the only way to deal with it is to think of them as kind of pointers. That, you know, that's a cart you don't want to put before the horse, but the system frequently demands that we do. If you work with it like that, it's, the system becomes kind of self-fulfilling. It's really easy to pick three key outcomes in ideas, stick them on your syllabus, and do what you need to do. It's nothing to do with teaching. That's to do with documenting um, call and response, really. So I, I don't want to sound really negative about that system, but to me that system is not about teaching. That's about documentation. It's connected to outcomes, it's connected to all that thing, but I wouldn't have that as my goal. Okay, so um, I want to I want to kind of continue with this this idea of clarity, as you put it, which is really a strategy of communication, because uh, setting clear expectations for your students is a challenge, and then com make, ensuring that that's actually been communicating that they heard or they understand that the um, so the the fundamental idea is that we put it in our syllabus. That's our contract between you and the students. But when you have very large classes, which all of you have in some form or another, how do you, what are the strategies that you have to, um, to know that you've communicated or to, uh, to provide that, the clear, clear expectations with your students? And uh, so what are the ways you do that? Well, I guess for me, the simplest way is to do a, a quiz on the first week of class, a quiz of the policies in their syllabus and what we've discussed the first day and just be sure they're really clear about some big things and and yeah provide links to to go back to the syllabus and and when i get questions i'll say what's actually in your syllabus page two paragraph four whatever and and then and then they know that i'm always going to redirect them back to the syllabi so i have um uh, like a contract, a memo of understanding. It's got 10 points on it, and this is for the big class. And and this is from experience, okay. So point number one is, I will not come and speak to my instructor at the end of class up on stage. We, I teach in the Kent. And that is because if you have a 1,000 students, I'll guarantee you 70 of them want to come and ask you a question. And if you spend one minute with each of those people, that's over an hour. Apart from that, that it's, you've got other things to do. The, the, guy, the production services guys have to get in there and clean all the popcorn and the uh, condoms away, right? So you've got to do something. You've got to sort something out. So what I say is absolutely not. You can't do this. The deadline is the deadline is the deadline. Point number whatever, too. I will make no excuses for not submitting my work on time. And so, as you say, what, whenever... So, these the thousands of these students, they have to sign, they have to submit it in Canvas. And it's all pointing to those, or it's all about those points of clarity about what their responsibilities are and what my responsibilities are. So that when a student says, oh, I, you know, I'm really sorry, I couldn't make the deadline because ABC, all I do is say, I would refer you to point three on the memo of understanding. And it seems kind of a bit harsh and hard-hearted, and I don't feel like I'm like that as a person. But it's, again, if you're dealing with a really big class, you, all you can do, because I'll guarantee you, a thousand people, and I spend the first week going over the syllabus, so three hours, I go through it page by page, and it's up on the screen, and I go through it as clearly as I can. And I say more times than I can count, I know that a whole bunch of you in here are not going to be hearing this. And I know that a whole bunch of you in here are going to be coming to me in two weeks saying, what about this, what about that? And I say, this is what I'm going to say to you. Go and look at your syllabus. And the thing is, two weeks' time, there'll be 100 emails saying, but I didn't hear or I don't understand. And the thing is, it's really frustrating because at that point, I don't know what else to do. I can't go to a thousand dorm rooms and knock on the door of each one and say, did you get everything? Is there anything I need to explain? Any, you know, you can't do that. And I, you can't do it because of the numbers, but I feel like that's kind of the way it should always be. At some point, we have to, y y you have to give students the responsibility of knowing stuff. 
that you've that you presented to them. I don't I don't see that is a zero sum game. Ultimately, at some point, you've got to draw a line in the sand and say, well, this is the information I've given to you in multiple places, as clear as I can. What else am I going to do? I don't think I really have much to add to that. Other than that, I was at Intech High School last night for the parent orientation, and every uh, instructor there handed us a syllabus uh, for our child's class classes, our freshman child's classes, <laughs> and we had to sign the syllabus. And I thought this is ridiculous because I'm signing these. I don't have time to read them. So the idea, I, I mean, I think I know where it happens that students get they get handed a syllabus. They're asked to you know, show some sign of acknowledgement that they've read it and that they know the policies and then they hand it back in or whatever. I, I don't necessarily think that's a great thing, but I do um, try to keep that in mind. It's sort of like Harrison said, you, you can't assume that these students are like you were as a student. I mean, as a student, I was incredibly uptight. I kept a multicolored schedule. You know, I copied all my notes out by hand and color coded them and then highlighted them. But most of these students don't do that. So what I do is I actually look at the syllabus uh, before class, every class session, and I more or less read the items that are um, coming up out loud to the students. I sometimes put them on a PowerPoint or I write them on the whiteboard or whatever. And I'm just constantly prompting them to go back to the syllabus, not, not when they have a question, but before the question can even arise. Don't forget that in two weeks, you know, X is due. For the next session, remember that we're reading, you know, these pages. And it seems a little bit, um, it seems a little bit almost infantilizing. Like I wouldn't have liked that particularly as a student, but I've gotten good responses from students. I really like how Professor Sand always reminds us that we have an assignment coming due. And I think, you know, you shouldn't need me to remind you that, but that sort of moralizing doesn't help them. So I just, I just leave that aside for this kind of thing. I would just add one thing. I, I um, I don't have my students sign the syllabus or anything like that either, but I certainly have a lot of language in my syllabus, and I really stress it the first week, of making sure the students are clear, and this is really your point, about whose responsibility it is to know what you're supposed to be doing. And they're, they're, it's not high school, right, where they're getting kind of hand, their hands held all the way through, but they don't know that right away. So I try to make very clear what their responsibilities are and how little sympathy I will have um, if they're not clear about that. What I do though, instead of having them sign the syllabus, is I do have a s assignment early in the term that is not worth very much. Because um, I think students have a hard time caring until there's a cost sometimes. And so I give them something that I actually half hope they fail at um, because even though it's not a lot of points, they get a D or an F, and it scares them, and it's kind of a wake-up call, and I get a lot of kind of freaking out. But then I don't, it just, well, look at the syllabus. Look, I told you, right? I mean, I have this in four places, and I've explained it five times, and whatever, right? And you didn't listen, and so it was the consequence. So luckily for you, it didn't matter that much. The next one will. Um, so, I mean, sometimes I think that those kinds of low-cost learning experiences for them early in the semester that kind of put them on their toes. Well, thank you. These were all wonderful nuggets of information. And um, there's many more questions I have. I would love to ask you how you manage your professional time-life balance in terms of balancing out your research load, your teaching load, and your service, and whatever role statements you have. But we don't have time for that. So um, perhaps afterwards you can you can chat with, with any of our panel members here. Um, but I want to reemphasize, uh, you talked a lot about uh, our institution, um, institutional support that you have here, that, um, that our provost um, and, and our previous provost and president have taken very seriously and have empowered us um, as, as support staff to help you, that you have that. But also, um, there is an atmosphere at this institution of um, collaboration amongst colleagues. And, and I've seen it um, go across uh, different campuses, at the regional campuses, where the um, different 
faculty members have organized themselves, and they've been across disciplines. And, um, and I would recommend that every, all of you continue that effort and take advantage of it. So thank you so very much. I appreciate all of your insights and your time. And, um, and best of luck to everybody in their teaching this year.